This week on Christian World News, hope for Pastor Andrew Brunson. New reports say the American pastor in prison for his faith in Turkey could be one step closer to freedom. We bring you the latest update from experts on the ground. Plus, the United States announces dramatic cuts to the amount of refugees allowed in the country. See why some Christian leaders say that's the wrong move. And has the world's most populated country declared war on Christianity? We'll take a closer look at what's fueling China's severe crackdown on Christians and how people of faith are responding to the government's persecution. Welcome to Christian World News, everyone. I'm Wendy Griffith. The Wall Street Journal is reporting American pastor Andrew Brunson could be released from Turkey at his next court hearing on October 12th. The nearly two years old saga has led to an international crisis between the two NATO allies. As Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, there's much more at stake than just world politics. The Turkish government moved Pastor Brunson from jail to house arrest in July. Although the 50-year-old pastor has ministered in the country for more than two decades, the Turkish government charged Brunson with conspiring against President Erdogan's rule during a 2016 attempted coup. The Trump administration calls those charges bogus and has made securing Pastor Brunson's freedom a priority. I don't think there's ever been any administration, any president that has brought up a prisoner of conscience, uh, a prisoner who's in, in prison because of his faith, uh, more than any other one than President Reagan did for Natan Sharansky. So this is historic. And the Trump administration went beyond talking, leveling sanctions on Turkey that put its currency into a free fall. All of the secular media, without exception, are saying, a pastor, who cares about a pastor? Uh, the trade with Turkey is much more important. The money and the value of the lira is much more important. But the Trump administration said, no, a pastor who's falsely accused and is in prison is important to us, and we're willing to really put our uh, money where our mouths are, and they're taking a strong stand. Egyptian-born Michael Youssef says other nations are paying attention. Now, the world is watching this. They are not ignoring this. They know that they're going to be next unless they stop persecuting Christians. Franklin Graham called Christians to pray and for the U.S. to be careful. First, I would ask everybody who's watching right now, the Christians, to pray for Andrew Brunson. He's been falsely accused. This is just a sham. Turkey, we have to remember that this is a country that is fast becoming uh, a radical Islamic state. I think we need to get Brunson home and we need to be very careful with uh, whatever we do as a country with Turkey until they change leadership and change the direction they're going. Karim says there's much more at stake than an international crisis between NATO allies. There's been many people, ourselves included, that believe God was going to do something in Izmir the ancient Smyrna, Izmir, where Andrew Brunson is today, that was going to impact, impact not only Turkey, but all the nations around it. Because it's clear that Andrew Brunson is in, in prison or under arrest for one reason, and that's his hope and faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, not only of the West, but of the entire world. And joining us all the way from Jerusalem is CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell. Chris, brother, it's great to see great you. Great to be with you, Wendy. Yeah, here, here in, in Virginia Beach. Here in Virginia yeah. Beach. Well, um, I've got to ask you, how likely do you think it is that Pastor Brunson will be released? What well, was that for you? I think it is likely. Uh, uh, there was a good, uh, that Wall Street uh, Journal report says uh, perhaps after this next hearing, uh, next month uh, could be. That's why it's so important to be praying, uh, praying for his release and praying that, that his imprisonment is really going to spread the gospel around the Middle East. That's true, because we've gotten our hopes up before. That's right. And, yeah. So, yeah. and there was a possibility of a deal last summer, uh, a couple of months ago. Right. It fell through, and I think President Trump was a little upset that he felt like President Erdogan may have uh, backtracked on that particular deal. But we'll see what happens uh, in a few days. 
Chris, how important is it that leading members of the U.S. government are really pushing for his release? You know, as I said in the story, it's historic. I mean, consider that uh, you have to go back to you know, Ronald Reagan and Tan Sharansky. He was a refusenik back in uh, many years ago, back in the uh, early 18, uh, 1980s, and, uh, and Reagan stood up for him. And now President Trump, Vice President Pence are standing up for uh, Pastor Brunson and making really an international scene between these two NATO allies. It's really almost unprecedented. And really, I think, a really one way that the Trump administration is standing up for religious freedom. How would you describe the relationship right now between the two nations, Turkey and the U.S.? Tense, because uh, <laughs> yeah. he's put sanctions on Turkey. Uh, the Turkey lira has been falling, uh, so I think very tense. And this is really one of the one of the main issues uh, between the two nations. Now, Brunson's daughter recently spoke out about this whole, whole ordeal being part of God's plan. Right. I want your thoughts on that, but first, let's take a look at this. I'll say there are times when I'm not necessarily happy with God's plan in this situation, but I've really come to realize that God is in complete control and he has a plan and this is all for his glory. This, he is worth everything that my family has gone through. And I've, I've seen that message coming through in letters from my dad as well, as he has started to transform and really submit to God and say, God, my life is yours. Whatever you do with me, let it honor you, let it, let it declare your name and your goodness to people. And I am inc incredible. Yeah. Chris, what is your response to that? And how can our viewers at home be praying? For well, they can be praying for his strength, uh, that he, he's, he's gone through such an ordeal in the last two years. Pray for his release, but also pray. And I think what his daughter said there, it's bigger than just Pastor Brunson. It really has taken Christianity to a whole new level inside Turkey, one of the least evangelized countries in the world. He's been ministering in Izmir, which is ancient Smyrna. This is one of the churches out of the book of Revelation. Uh, so really, it's really spreading and taking the Christianity to a whole new level, not only in Turkey, but in other nations uh, around Turkey and making uh, his case visible in a much greater way than ever before. All right. Thanks for covering this and keeping us up to date. And we will certainly be praying for Amen. Pastor Brunson and his family. Incredible testimony from his daughter. Exactly. Yeah. Great to see you here in, in the here. United States. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, coming up, while the U.S. plans to cut back on the number of refugees allowed in the country, hundreds of evangelical leaders are standing up in their defense. A group of evangelical leaders is pressing the Trump administration to increase the number of refugees the U.S. admits. This comes after the Secretary of State announced dramatic cuts. CBN's Heather Sells has details. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo released plans last week to limit the number of refugees allowed into the U.S. by 15,000 next year. That would cut the number to 30,000 overall, the lowest since Congress first passed the Refugee Act in 1980. Leaders from the Evangelical Immigration Table are asking the administration for more, not less. They want a cap of at least 75,000, in keeping with U.S. tradition since the early 2000s. Since 1980, we've seen both uh, Republican and Democratic administrations uh, receiving refugees at pretty high numbers. These Christian leaders say the U.S. is not only breaking with tradition, it's cutting numbers at a moment when the help is most needed. The number of 30,000 is really concerning because right now we're facing the world's worst refugee crisis since World War II. Across the globe, some 25 million refugees, many from Syria, are trying to escape danger in their homeland. Advocates say they're surprised at this recent move to cut the number of refugees because in addition to the Trump administration touting international religious freedom, the president himself has vowed to help persecuted Christians. As it relates to persecuted Christians, do you, do you see them as kind of a priority here? As yes. A, as a per, you do? Yes, they've been horribly treated. But State Department numbers show with the overall drop in the number of refugees admitted the last two years, the number of Christian refugees admitted here has also declined. Still, the Trump administration says admitting refugees to the U.S. is not the only way to help them. Sometimes it's better and more economical to keep them in their region. The president made that point Tuesday in his speech at the U.N. The most compassionate policy is to place refugees as close to their homes as possible, to ease their eventual return to be part of the rebuilding process.
<laughs> and joining me now is Heather Sells. Heather, is there any wiggle room in the in the cap on this number? Yeah, well, a week or so ago, we were hearing yes. Um, now we're hearing not so much. And one of the reasons is the president is supposed to consult with Congress on this, right. and in particular, the Senate Judiciary Committee, which, as you know, has a little uh, other few agenda items right now. What do you think the administration's goal is in reducing the number of refugees that can come in? Well, their stated goal is that a compassionate response involves allowing refugees to stay in the region as opposed to bringing them over to the U.S., and then it's also more economical. Mm. But this, of course, is a pivot because the president just a year and a half ago sat down with our David Brody and said, I'm going to prioritize uh, bringing Christian refugees here. So, I, you know, there's definitely an inner debate within the administration right now as to what's the best route to take. Is this in any way about uh, screening who's coming in? Um, is that, is this, because there were those, they're, they're, the Muslim countries, they've already been targeted. Yeah, as... I, I think it's a combination of there's a voice in the administration, you know, this whole make a, America should be first. And so, yes, we don't even want to worry about who's coming into the U.S., so we're going to lower the numbers. Um, but at the same time, uh, the administration has to develop a response to those who, who are refugees, who are fleeing for their faith. What is our response going to be? And so this is a change, lowering the number to this historic level, yeah. this historic low, when for years we've welcomed a lot of refugees. What about... Christians who are being persecuted overseas that really need to be here um, or could face, you know, possible death or, or who knows what, how will they be affected by this? They won't be able to get into the U.S. as easily with the number being set at 30,000. So uh, that yeah. that really is a surprise that the administration is taking this, this stance, given that it really has promoted international religious freedom as well. All right. Thanks so much, Heather. We appreciate that report. Well, coming up, China launches another crackdown on Christians. See why Chinese pastors say they are ready to die for their faith. And welcome back to Christian World News. China has launched an all-out war against the country's Christians. They're destroying crosses, targeting churches, burning Bibles, and throwing pastors into prison. CBN's George Thomas and Emily Jones give you an inside look at what's behind this latest crackdown in our new segment, World Beat. Take a look. This is World Beat, the show where we tell you what's happening in the world. And also how you can pray about it. Well, today, George, we're talking about a country you've been to many times, China. That's right, Emily. And the question today is, has the world's most populated country declared war on Christianity. In recent months, China has waged an aggressive campaign against Christians, targeting their houses of worship, destroying crosses, burning Bibles, and even arresting pastors. Our next guest once predicted that China could become the world's largest Christian nation. Does he still think that's possible in this climate of persecution? Joining me to discuss China's campaign against Christians is Fang Gong Yang, director of the Center on Religion and Chinese Society at Purdue University and a leading expert on religion in China. Thanks for coming uh, on the show. Mr. Yang, has China declared war on Christianity? Yes, uh, in recent months, uh, there have been a big campaign going on in China. And who is behind uh, this massive anti-Christian campaign? Well, the campaign was first experimented in Zhejiang province in 2014 to 2016. Now it has become a nationwide campaign, especially in central China, such as Henan province and the Jiangxi province. This means that the decision was not by a local government official, but must have come from the very top of Chinese leadership, the Chinese Communist Party's Politburo and the chairman Xi Jinping himself. And my understanding, Mr. Yang, is that it's not just Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, uh, and other faith groups are facing increased scrutiny in government attempts to uh, what they call sinicize religion, right? Yeah, that's right. The current campaign is on all religions. The campaign is called Zhongguohua in Chinese. I would not translate that as sinicization or sanification, but the Chinification. Sinicization or sanification implies cultural adaptation. Christians have been doing that all along. In fact, they have done probably too well so that they have converted so many people. But the Chinification is a political campaign demanding for political loyalty to the Chinese Communist Party, 
and the so-called socialist system. The campaign also applies to Taoism. Taoism is a religion originated in China, and how can you become more Chinese than that? It is certainly more Chinese than the Communist Party, which follows foreign leaders of Marx and Lenin. But they require Taoism to go through Chinification too. It means that the Taoist leaders must express their loyalty to the Chinese Communist Party. Okay, Mr. Yang, these are very serious times in China, and I thank you for coming on the show and providing some insight. Mr. Yang uh, from Purdue University, thanks for coming on the broadcast. Well, every day it's becoming harder to be a Christian in China, but despite government persecution, believers are not backing down. In fact, more than 344 Chinese Christian leaders released a joint statement declaring their faith in Jesus. They write, for the sake of the gospel, we are prepared to bear all losses, even the loss of our freedom and our lives. Powerful, powerful words. We're here to tell us more about how the church is responding to this, is, to this persecution, is Todd Nettleton from Voice of the Martyrs. Todd, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Todd, what is your reaction to this declaration from these Chinese leaders, and what does it say about the resilience of the Chinese church? Well, my first reaction is just a little bit of awe, honestly, at the courage that it takes in the face of an onslaught from a communist government to not only write this letter, but then to sign your name to it, to say publicly, no, I stand for Christ. I don't care what the government does. These pastors know very well what they could face for publicly criticizing the government, for publicly signing this letter. So my first thought is just, wow, what courage they have. The other thought that comes to my mind is uh, the famous Chinese house church pastor, Samuel Lamb, who I had the privilege of meeting in Guangzhou, used to say, more persecution, more growing. And he would talk about how the church grew through persecution. And so uh, I think of that and I think of with excitement about the growth that we're going to see in the Chinese church, even though it comes through stormy waters. Absolutely. And Todd, you've been to China. You've seen these house churches there. Paint the picture. What is it like to be a pastor in such a hostile environment? Well, the thing about being a pastor in a house church in China is that every single time you meet, it's illegal. The police could come in at any time. They could arrest you. They could take you off to jail. Now, that doesn't happen every week. Every house church pastor doesn't get arrested, but every single house church pastor knows that they could get arrested. You talked about how the underground church is growing. How, how far and how wide has it grown in China? Well, the underground church reaches every corner of China, and, and that's the exciting thing is all across China, there are house churches, there are what they call family churches. And the reason the communist government is so worried is because there are far more Christians in China than there are members of the Communist Party. So if you're power base, if the way you maintain control is the Communist Party, and you just look at those numbers, you get afraid, you get worried. And so this crackdown, I think, is a direct response to the fear of the Communist Party leaders who see the church growing way faster than the party is. That's so powerful. Well, Todd Nettleton from Voice of the Martyrs, thank you so much for your insights. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me. It was a popular book, and now it's going to the big screen. The Trump Prophecy, the story of a firefighter who says God told him Donald Trump would become president years before he even announced he would run. It's now a movie, but it hasn't been without controversy. My job as a fireman was to react calmly. But what I saw last night scared me so much. The Trump Prophecy movie is the story of former firefighter Mark Taylor, who says he received a special message from God in 2011, that then businessman Donald Trump was headed for the White House. Producer Rick Eldridge says he wasn't sure he wanted to do the film. I knew it was going to be controversial. I knew it was not going to be an easy movie to make. But uh, I also knew that we had a nation that, that really needed to hear some messages of, of God's intervention in our country. The movie relives the night. Mark Taylor received what he calls the commander-in-chief prophecy. 
I didn't know a lot about Donald Trump. Um, I just knew he was a very powerful businessman, had a, built this empire. So I'm listening to him on an interview, and all of a sudden, I just heard the voice of the Lord say, you're hearing the voice of a president. Mark went into his office, got out a pen and paper, and started to write what he says the Holy Spirit told him. He was saying that basically that America was going to prosper like never before. Um, Israel and America, the ties between the two countries would be stronger than ever before. Uh, the dollar would be the strongest it was ever been. It was very detailed as far as what God was showing me. Chris Nelson, an actor and film professor at Liberty University, played the part of Taylor. People will hear the title and they think it's all about Trump. It's really about a common man hearing from the Lord and being given wisdom and advice from you know fellow believers to pray about that. One of those believers was Mary Colbert, wife of Dr. Don Colbert, who was treating Mark for an illness. After hearing Mark's prophecy, she started a nationwide prayer movement for the presidential election, a movement that became a key part of the movie. There's a mandate for us as believers to pray for those in authority over us. And so that's a deeper message that we really emphasize in the movie. Action! The film was made with the help of Liberty University film students, despite the fact that thousands of students signed a petition saying they didn't want the movie made. Facebook also was not a fan and temporarily blocked all promotional ads, claiming the movie was too political. But Nelson says most people were just reacting to the T word. They get squirmy when they hear the words Trump and God together <laughs> yeah. because they, they think that somehow it's lessening, I think, who God is by even mentioning his name with Trump. And I think, well, goodness, aren't we all glad that that's not how we feel about ourselves? Despite the controversy, Eldridge believes this movie needed to be made. We have such a divided nation right now, so I hope this film in some way can be maybe uh, a point toward healing. Well, thanks so much for joining us this week on Christian World News. Until next week, from all of us here, goodbye and God bless you. Thank you.